Women's Week in Missouri Public Media this week from the state capitol in Jefferson City. We're actually in the office of the Lieutenant Governor, Mike Keogh. Thank you for the hospitality. Hey, we're glad to have you. Thanks for being here. Congratulations on your uh, election win, I guess, last month now. Time's flying. Yeah, it's a very humbling experience, as you know, based on my background to uh, be elected by all the citizens of the state was uh, incredible and uh, something my wife and I will never forget. Something you've been very active in this year is helping with the state's COVID response, retool some businesses, maybe even help folks have some of the PVE they need. Where does the state uh, stand right now as far as when do you anticipate a vaccine? And, and there was, I know there's been a lot of this left to the states. What is the plan for distributing the vaccine? Well, you know, Governor Parson just a couple of weeks ago announced his plan to distribute the vaccine. Missourians can go on the website uh, under Department of Health and see what that plan looks like right now. Uh, the next step that will happen is the feds approving that, which we expect to happen any day. Uh, on how they're going to distribute the vaccine and then which you know critical care people will kind of be first in line if you will uh, seems like healthcare workers uh, folks in nursing homes seem to uh, from what i'm hearing seem to be kind of the the first people that we want to get to the, the folks that are in that vulnerable population piece uh, and then we'll continue to go from there but that's exciting news that we have that coming forward and uh, missouri and missourians will be ready as you mentioned uh, we have many missouri manufacturers in the uh, PPE business now that weren't, you know, nine yeah. months ago. And uh, so big credit to them and their families and their communities for stepping up and helping us with that effort. On the uh, politics side, the governor's talked about a COVID liability law, been a lot of debate. Looks like maybe that's not going to be something that happens right away here in December. Why, if you're just a guy that maybe owns a gun store in West Plains, why does that COVID liability law matter to you? Well, if, if you're anybody that owns any kind of business from a school district to a hospital, to a restaurant, to a gun store, to a manufacturer, uh, I think what you want to know is that you have protections of, of against uh, something that nobody has any control over. And um, uh, if you're a small business owner or manufacturer, like I said, that you want to have some peace of mind that if I open the doors of my business mm -hmm. to sell a product or to manufacture a product, I am not going to be held responsible if somebody gets this virus. Because the problem is, it's very hard to pinpoint where did that come from. So, you know, employees are patrons of businesses. They also go to other places, to other venues, to work, to who knows where you get this thing from at this point in time right now. So I think it's important for businesses to understand that they have some protection. We, we always want people's day in court, which is the other side's argument yeah. is that you know, this, this eliminates Missourians from having their day in court. No, certainly if somebody's reckless, yeah. uh, you know, that's, that's a different story. Uh, we just want common sense protections for Missouri business owners across the state. Uh, I was very excited to have you on this week because you know this state, it's in your blood, maybe it's better than anybody else I know well, from where you've lived to be in work, your work with MoDOT to Lieutenant Governor and the Senate. This is a very diverse state and there's a lot of talk even in the Senate today about there are places in the state that you pretty much are open, southern Missouri, northern Missouri, rural Missouri. Then there's places with some restrictions, even some rural counties like Lafayette County has some. Now Jefferson County has some, St. Louis County has quite a few. I, I've, I've always tried to praise the response the administration's had on letting local governments decide. You know this state better than anybody. Why is that such an important thing? Well, because we're not a one-size-fits-all state. You know, you can't paint the state of Missouri with one just big brush. And so letting local control happen to where local uh, county commissioners or their health department directors or their hospital folks have gotten together and said, here's the reason we need to do this or not do this. That's where that authority needs to be. Those are the local people elected by the local folks, and they're the ones that should be making that decision. When you have a governor, uh, any governor, uh, whether it's a Republican or Democrat, whether it's this crisis or another crisis, and you give him or her that broad range authority, uh, you know, my question would be, what is next? There are other things out there on the horizon. For instance, I don't want the governor to tell me I have to get the vaccine. I want that to be my choice. I want that to be Missourians' choice. Now, I think a lot of people will get it, by the way, but I want it to be their choice. And it's the same with some of these other mandates. Well, you get the vaccine when it's appropriate and the first responders have got it and all that? Yes. But everybody, there, there are a lot of frontline critical people that need to get it way before sure. I do. So, but yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't have a problem with it at all. I really believe, and, and that maybe this comes from my background, if there's guys in Ripley County, if you told them to wear a mask, they start burning the things in front of the health department. You saw in St. Francis County, they found fewer people wore a mask when you ordered them around than when you asked them. Right. Well, I think you're, you're exactly right. And uh, as you mentioned, we've traveled the state quite a bit. Uh, I like to use the example, uh, we were at a broadband uh, expansion announcement down in Iron County. And the announcement was held for COVID reasons. The announcement was held outside on a sawmill, lumberyard, traditional 
Iron County, you've been to those sawmills before, oh. parking lot, right? And so there's 20 people there and they're from the telephone exchange and the school superintendents there and some of the guys who work for the, the lumber yard are there. They're gonna have high speed internet, by the way, for the first time in their company's life. And you know, everybody was spaced out, we're all outdoors and um, folks on social media were you know, sending me notes, why weren't you wearing a mask? Well, you know, in Iron County, if you go there and say, you know, I'm coming, but everybody needs to wear a mask, you might not, well, go. Yep. Uh, because uh, they're, you know, they're very much set in the ways of uh, what they think is right and wrong, and they don't want government telling them what to do. And uh, I don't really want to tell them what to do. But to your point, if you continue to educate Iron Countyans or Rental Countyans or Nottaway Countyans and say, here's something that could help, here's what you could do, here's what you could do, I think you get a much better take rate uh, than you do of saying you're going to do this. I always love to get a lot better out of us Midwesterners by asking instead of telling. Right. Something I've seen be an interesting development is agritourism. It has been coming on and on. Tom Wright down in Miller County has a house. It's the darndest thing. It's just out in the field. Of, and he rents it to Kansas City people, and they rent it every week. And I'm like, is it on a river? A he said, nope, it's just in the middle of the field. It's my dad's old pace. I couldn't believe it. But that, is, that has been something that's not only been laying the groundwork for, but I think COVID has actually helped that industry, hasn't it? Well, first of all, I've been to Tom and Dory Wright's cabin in Miller <laughs> County. Just that probably doesn't surprise you, but it's a really cool place if you've actually been there. But agritourism is the number one growing sector in our um, industry here, not only in the state, but the United States, because to your point, there's people from urban uh, parts of this country who have never seen a cow up close, who have never seen a combine uh, work out in the field, who have never seen you know, a hog farm. Uh, I had a legislator down from the Kansas City area to our farm, took her out on a gator and said, we're gonna go check the cattle, had a bag of range cubes in the back, cattle of course, see the gator, smell the range cubes, come over, and she's snapping a million pictures, and she's, I can't wait to show my kids and all my friends this, I actually got to see a cow. I mean, and that person yeah. would have paid to go do that. And it was something I never even thought of, but uh, agritourism sure is something that's uh, gained some speed in our economy. Talk about a highway, something you've been involved for a very long time. I see the sign in your office, I-57. Uh, you know, when uh, Governor Parson was elected, you were elected. It looks like that's kind of the time when people get ideas early in that administration. That's usually when something big can happen. Is there a chance to do something to actually bring our infrastructure up to where it needs to be. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, the governor's uh, foundation of who he is going to be is workforce development and infrastructure. And uh, we've made some progress in both of those areas. As you know, his bridge program uh, that we did the bridge bonding for and infrastructure was a big hit to a lot of rural communities across the state where one of their bridges closed. It's a 20 or 30 mile detour. And so uh, getting those bridges in safe conditions is important. But I, to answer your question, I think our infrastructure piece of the conversation uh, and, and the governor's first full term now will continue to evolve, and I believe we're going to see um, s some ways to fix our funding problem. There's some uh, new ideas that are uh, running around out there. Some other states have tried, and uh, more and more stakeholders are getting on board. The agriculture industry, the manufacturing industry um, are getting on board on how important it is to keep those roads and bridges open. And corridors like I-57, very exciting news that we could have down in your part of the world, down in southeast Missouri. Uh, we need to continue to advance that, and I'm, I'm, I'm literally don't want to leave this building until we figure out a way to fix that. And I'd like to leave Scott to get back to business <laughs> and cattle and everything else. So uh, that's not a threat to stay; that's a threat to get something done. Well, you just got uh, another four years in this building, and I, I have to wonder: uh, you've been involved in government back when Republicans just didn't win everything automatically. Were you a little surprised by the election results? Not not yours specifically, but how well the party, Republican Party, did overall? Well, you know, in the state of Missouri, what I'll say is, and, and you travel the state a lot, too, and you know what Missouri values are. And um, you go around the state of Missouri, and people who have Missouri values sometimes don't say, I'm a Democrat or I'm a yeah. Republican. They say, I'm pro-life, and I'm pro-Second Amendment, and I'm for common sense, and I want government out of my life. And then they voted for the candidates in Missouri that they thought that fit those good Christian family values. So I wasn't really surprised that it was so slanted to the direction of what I call the common sense direction. Uh, I think that was the, uh, I think that's the way it leaned based on what the input I was hearing from all over the state. Might not be a bigger supporter of first responders in the state than you. I mean, your office is filled with awards thanking you for it. I really thought that cut deep and was very hard for some state Democrats to, to carry that national message. 
Yeah, I think it, it probably was. But, you know, the first responders, uh, just to tell you quickly, if you're an Irish immigrant like our family was to North City, St. Louis, you were either a fireman or a policeman. And so, you know, <laughs> uh, I consider uh, the fire and police community my family. And, and, and fortunately, they consider me the same. So whatever I can do for those folks, I'm always happy to. But I know there was some mixed emotions uh, based on who they were supporting nationally versus maybe who they were supporting on a statewide basis. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, those are a great group of people, and I'm always going to be honored to have them on my side. Governor, thank you so much for the hospitality. We really appreciate it. It's uh, my pleasure. Merry Christmas to you and your family, Merry by Christmas the way. Merry Christmas to yours as well. We'll be right back. We're going to have four senators join us after this. But first, go to showmissouri.com. This is Missouri One County Time. We were in Knox County, the commissioner with the greatest mustache in all Missouri politics, Evan Glasgow. <laughs> go learn all about Knox County and its rich history and its outstanding mustache on its commission. Right, we'll be right back after this. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right to work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Your energy needs are changing. That's why at Ameren, Missouri, we're not waiting on the future. We're building it with the Smart Energy Plan, advancing thousands of projects across the state, helping reduce emissions through cleaner energy sources, boost reliability with self-healing equipment, and better withstand storms with new composite poles. Moving Missouri forward and bringing us all a little closer together. That's energy at work, Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back to Missouri Politics from the state capitol. We're still in the Lieutenant Governor's office. It's official vote here. Joined by Senator Brian Williams, St. Louis County. Thanks for joining us. I'm proud to be here, Scott. Thanks for having me. Danny Hoskin, Warrensburg Pride, thanks for having us. Thanks yes. for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Lincoln Huffman down in Green County, thank you for yeah. sticking around. Welcome back to the Lieutenant Governor's office. And the uh, Minority Leader of the Missouri State Senate, uh, John Rizzo from Jackson County, thank you, sir, for joining us. Thanks for having us. Let's start off. This was, uh, I think everything in life kind of has been, COVID's been a factor for a while. Uh, the state's response, uh, you saw today when they were debating the budget bills. It talked about how it's almost like Goldilocks. To some on the left, this they want more state orders. To some on the right, they want they, they don't like the little control because they want the state government to come take over. Uh, where are things in Jackson County right now? Well, I think in, in Jackson County, there's several things that we're working through. I think that obviously we have a mask mandate and we're doing the different things throughout the city of Kansas City and Jackson County as a whole. But one of the biggest worries that we have is people outside of Jackson County that don't have mask mandates are coming into Jackson County and taking ICU hospital bed space. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at one time, uh, the mayor of uh, Columbia said in Boone County, 75% of the people in their ICUs related to COVID were from outside of Columbia, outside of Boone County, with places that didn't have mask mandates. So I, I think we're working through it. I think everybody's doing the best they can right now. Uh, you have to walk that fine line of being safe and, and protecting people as well as not uh, shutting down small businesses throughout the county. So it's, it's just a, a give and take. I think everybody's doing the best job. Brian Williams, it seems like everything in the state it ends up about St. Louis at some point. The discussion now is some folks in St. Louis County, they don't like the local control because the local control has imposed some restrictions. Sam Page has decided there's going to be some forms of shutdowns, some restaurants you can't eat inside. Uh, what's the state of play in St. Louis County right now? Well, I think it's, uh, it's simple. I mean, our hospital beds are, are, I mean, filled to capacity. And, you know, reality, we're learning that this virus is a moving target day by day. I mean, we're finding out something new. Uh, we don't know how transmission is, is, is actually transmitted. And I think right now we need to think about the population of folks that really are, are um, defenseless. And I think it requires us to wear masks and, and maintain a distance and 
that's just what we have to do. And I think there's light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, we hear there's uh, a, a positive trajectory around the uh, vaccine. And I think once we get there, I think things will become better for businesses as well as folks being able to do what they like to do. Senator Huff, you've been a representative in this building, but you've also been a commissioner back in Green yeah. County. Uh, where should those decisions be made? Is that is that something the health department should do, or is that something that ought to fall with? My assumption is more people know the commissioners in Green County than those on the health board, and I think that's the case in a lot of Missouri counties. Well, I would say that's probably true prior to COVID, but now <laughs> what we've had is uh, a spotlight shown on uh, that you know that administrative department within. We have a Springfield and County Health Department, so it's a merged uh, department. But uh, our health director down there is. You know, probably quoted as much as anyone yeah. in that community now and, and statewide. And I think what Senator Rizzo said is, you know, 100% accurate. We're all working through this. I mean, that's what this amounts to. This amounts to a balance. It amounts to the moving, the moving target that is this pandemic that fluctuates. I mean, our hospitals, we've got Cox and Mercy in Springfield. Both of those, you know, we get kind of a daily tabulation of where they are on bed space and. Cox actually built a COVID ward at the beginning of this that's now full, and a lot of those are folks from surrounding communities. Uh, Springfield's got a mask mandate, the county does not. So I believe those decisions ought to be left to those local local organizations. Yeah, you know, uh, you better in finance. I believe for a long time, the state had a policy, and certainly the major hospital chain had a policy that if you get hurt in Warsaw, Missouri, Maybe there's a small place that does a few things, but they'll send you ultimately to Springfield or Kansas City or to, to Warrenburg. Right. I, I'm not sure that what you're seeing with COVID, of course, the serious cases are at the major metropolitan areas. That's the way the system's set up, right? That is the way the system's set up. And we have a great uh, hospital in Warrensburg. I know many of our hospitals are, are getting filled up with uh, COVID uh, patients, but you know, for the most part, a lot of the rural hospitals are, are set up for um, kind of your less emergency type of procedures. Uh, and then uh, we send them to, you know, the big metropolitan uh, hospitals when, when something does go wrong. Let me ask you a question. Uh, Senator Wayne referenced the vaccine. The vaccine is something that when it's available after the folks in nursing homes and the firefighters and cops and nurses have had it, when it comes down to being available to you, some people take it. It's something that I would consider taking. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be down on the food chain a little yeah. bit. Most certainly we want to have those healthcare workers and the high-risk individuals uh, take be able to take that vaccine first. but. Uh, once once they've taken it and we kind of see the side effects of that, I, it's something that I would consider taking. So anyway, when that vaccine comes to you, will you take it? Absolutely. But when it's time for me, for sure. me I think it's so many folks that we need to take in high consideration. First, our frontline health care uh, professionals, uh, mm -hmm. clearly our, um, our elderly and, and uh, uh, you know, compromised uh, folks. So once we get through those folks, I'd be more than happy to take the vaccine. So uh, when it comes time and it's offered to you, will you take it? Sure. And I think like uh, Senator Williams, Senator Hoskins said, you know, I think we're going to be fairly far down the pecking order. I think there's a lot of individuals, a lot of first responders out there. And quite frankly, I would put uh, teachers yeah, in the yeah. same Absolutely. same category because they're, I mean, in my opinion, they're, they're front line right now with the students that they've got in the classrooms. So I assume when it's offered, you'll take the vaccine? Yeah, as, as long as Dr. Fauci says it's okay. I trust that guy. He's a straight shooter. So if Dr. Fauci says it's okay, most things are going to be all right with me. How long do you think you've seen the, the state's plan and Missouri's plan until things kind of get back to normal? Not just with the cases. I assume those will go down as the vaccine's out. But just how I'll the peace of mind of folks. I don't think it'll take it. Uh, you know, I, I still think we're probably a year away. I mean, you know, you'll, you'll see it happen in phases, in my personal opinion. I think you'll start to see certain things open back up, and you'll have, uh, you know, I've always said that you can have as many businesses open it as you want. If people don't feel safe, they're not going to come out there. Yeah. So as you see people get more vaccinations and become more comfortable, and maybe you have people that have already had it, and they have uh, antibodies, and they get more comfortable with being out in public, you'll start to see things happen in phases. So... You know, but, but that's not going to be overnight. Uh, you know, they're looking at maybe 20 million vaccines out by the end of the month. This month, that's going to obviously get taken up pretty quickly. Just as the process gets through, uh, that's going to take a while. All right. But there's light at the end of the tunnel. Which so we wrap up with two questions yeah. here. One, uh, in, in the session, where will the authority be in these third-class counties to make the health order decisions? Will it be at the commission? Will it be at the health department? Will you even be able to do it at all? You know, I, I, I think that's going to have to work through the process. I, I don't know. Um, I hope that I, I would let science make those decisions and, and your outbreaks make those decisions and, and not Jefferson City. But 
you know, they are old fashioned Republican, believe more in local control, but you know, <laughs> probably makes you Republican more. <laughs> where, where does that end up, uh, Senator? Up? When, when, in the session, who's going to make those decisions in those third class counties? So, my guess will be that there will be some type of oversight um, with some sort of elected body. I mean, there's obviously some legislation already floating around. Uh, I talked to one of our colleagues this morning even about, you know, maybe. Maybe within a certain time frame of a decision or, or an ordinance being enacted in a community, that that the elected body of that community kind of has almost like a like a retroactive veto authority, so they want to see if it's working and, and have some oversight. I think uh, I think there will be some sort of oversight. That chapter of State Hall will be visited by the Missouri General Assembly. Then? I imagine it will be. What do you think? Where, where should that end up? Well, in fact, I, I filed a bill dealing with that. Same thing, I believe it's Senate Bill 20, but basically it says that a health board or, or an elected health um, director makes a decision as far as a mask mandate, then that has to be approved by the local municipality as well. So whether it's the county commissioners, whether it's the city council, they have to approve any mandates that the health board uh, tries to enact. So I think it would be a combination of both. You're in a pleasure to know it's always highly scrutinized, but essentially I believe Sam Page kind of does have some ability to affect that. Does that stay the same in large counties like yours? Yeah, I think it pretty much stays the same, but at the end of the day, it comes down to science, um, seeing what the, the number of cases are looking like. And right now, like I said before, I mean, COVID-19 is a moving target, and every day is different, and we should treat it as such. Sir Hoskins, that governor ran on local control. He ran on letting places like San Luis County make their decisions and Ripley County make theirs. I think he sticks with that, right? I don't, I don't think he goes back and does a mess, but I also don't know that he's going to be too keen on telling those big counties what to do. I, I think when the dust settles, it's probably where it settles, right? I believe that it does settle where it settles. I mean, Governor Parson won a re-election on a, on a message of local control, not having a, a statewide mask mandate. I think he sticks to his guns and we end up exactly where we're at. So, I mean, if session ran July to November, July to December, I think maybe you'd have saw momentum to pass a bill that would take away some of the ability for Jackson County to their own health orders. But I think because where the vaccine is going to fall, it, it seems to me that you don't even really get a bill to him to go around and, and tell Green County what to do. Yeah, I think this is going to end, you know, Senator Williams mentioned the vaccine and Senator Rizzo. I mean, this, this moving target of how, how bad the second surge gets when the vaccine, you know, becomes really readily available, I think it also alters that conversation that we have. Hopefully this is a once in a generation, if not once in a multi-generational yeah. Um, you know, pandemic that we've all experienced and gone through. So my hope would be that, you know, we take a pretty, pretty deliberate and thoughtful approach to any changes that we're going to make that are going to have lasting effects on those local communities. I think, I think the local communities are best suited to make those decisions. Something tells me you might take some floor time if that bill moved very far in the center. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe things possible in that very soon. Well, let me ask you, uh, there was a hearing uh, this week on uh, the state budget. Where are your, uh, probably the the most high profile person that deals with the state budget. Where is the state budget's finances right now? So we're actually not, I mean, we've, we've, we've had a serious infusion of federal dollars, almost $3 billion uh, from the federal government that normally we don't have that's, that's coming to the state. And it's propped up uh, a lot of shortfalls that have been created when economies do shut down. So um, the, the very short version of the story is we're not doing too bad right <laughs> now. Uh, I think a lot of people that, you know, that, that deal with, you know, the, the finances of the state are always cautious about saying, oh, we're, we're fine, things are okay. Because even, even in a normal year for, the, for our state budget, you know, last year we appropriated money based on 1.7% mm -hmm. general growth. Uh, that, to me, if you're under 2%, that's still very almost anemic economic growth, okay? And, and we have so many needs from the infrastructure to education to, I mean, now I mean, you can see community health um, at this state, that there's never any shortage of need. The thing that we're dealing with right now is having a little more availability to plug holes in things with CARES dollars that have come in from the feds. You look at it right now, I mean, I remember this from the last economic downturn. There was one year grace period. The federal government came in and threw a bunch of money to the state, which got it through the first year. It was that second year, but I also wonder, we talked about this, Maybe instead of going to Hawaii, people bought a new TV at the local Best Buy and paid a sales tax on it, or maybe they redid a room or something. I wonder, I, it seems to me there'll be a bit softer landing than it was after the crash in Hawaii. Uh, I think that, so the last I had looked, November jobs numbers were the worst they were since July. 
And I, I only bring that up because I think that we've peaked on where people are getting back to work, right? I think the people that were getting back to work are now back to work. And the people that unfortunately have lost their jobs, they've lost their jobs. So it'll be interesting to see what the next 30 days hold in regards to jobs numbers, because that's obviously how we get revenues and things like that. And we'll have a better look at it in April. But you saw these past few months, the job numbers were really good, really good, really good, because people were getting back into work with, with precautions and things like that. This month was the first month they weren't great. And I think what you're seeing is that plateau now. So December is going to be a very interesting month, just from the fact of Christmas holiday spending, uh, things like that, as well as people getting back to work if those numbers have become stagnant. And everybody that was looking for a job has found their job, and those that are out of job are out of job and this is what the economy is for the short term, we're going to have to see what those revenues are going to look like for us. Yeah, I, I assume a lot of time they turn up the CPA and they're wondering how, how's this leverage out and balance. Uh, it looks to me like you do have about maybe one year grace with, with CARES money, and maybe the federal government will do more. What do you do after that? Well, that's, that's what we dealt with in 2008, 2010. When I was a state representative, we had a lot of federal dollars that came in and plugged some holes, and then after that, uh, we had to make some very tough decisions. And those decisions, whether it's this year or next year or the year following, will not be easy. But that's why they elected us to represent, um, uh, you know, constituents re elected us to represent them in the Missouri State Senate. And we'll have some tough decisions to make, I believe, next year and the year after that. So sure. I think the most interesting part of the recovery of this is this, you represent the state's economic engine in San Luis County. Does that engine fire back up to what it was before? Well, it depends, but I think at the end of the day, there needs to be priorities put in place, and that's ensuring that we're taking care of our, our teachers, our education systems are being funded, our healthcare systems are being properly funded, uh, small businesses are putting in a position to recover, uh, and if we don't really focus on those things being the keystone to recovery in this state, then I, I think we continue to move in a, in a backwards trajectory, so it just depends on priorities. It's not necessarily about uh, how much money we have, but how we spend the money that we have. I want to real quick, so that one the week, uh, talk to your staff is at the Capitol here. Quick shout out. <laughs> well, uh, I would have to say one a week is every uh, state employee in the building. Because and who's in your office? Oh, well, my chief of staff, uh, Robert Arbuthnot, and uh, Christine Bryan, who serves as my executive assistant. Senator Hoskins, will folks call your office? Who are they talking to? Uh, Kelly Rogers, my legislative assistant. Rachel Byers, my chief of staff. Everyone knows her well here. Uh, who's in your office? Nicole? So Robin Stone, uh, formerly with uh, Senator Lawson, mm -hmm. so knows Southwest Missouri, knows my district pretty well, and then uh, Pat Thomas. We were. She was busy. We had her. I know. Yeah. She she asked if I could sit in. For her. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank yeah. You. Right. Thanks. Uh, Senator Rosen, when they call, who are they talking to? Uh, they're probably going to talk to Lisa Hurst first. She has a hard time. The Legends, uh, uh, yes. Who uh, has a uh, uh, state law to himself? Only baby had a conversation. We are not going to, we're not going to, uh, Tom, talk about Tom, obviously. We're going to leave it there. We'll see you next week for End of the Year show with Attorney General Eric Schmidt back on our San Luis Obispo. This Week in Missouri Politics, sponsored by the Missouri Association of Career Fire Protection Districts, Spire, and Sterling Bank. 